Hey y'all, I'm Derek. Welcome to Bad Movie Fry Night. This episode, we're looking at another classic from John Carl Beekler. But before we get into the movie, I have to let you know a little bit about the production company, the one that I've talked about a few times on this show already, Empire International. In 1983, Charles Band, being upset with how his movies were being released by the big box studios and chasing the independent publishing zeitgeist of the 1980s, remember this is the era that gave us independent comics like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and the film studio, The Canon Group created his own studio, Empire International. The first releases of the company, Ghost Warrior and Dungeon Master, received a small theatrical release in America, but set the studio up for future success. In 1985, their first box office hit, Ghoulies, gave Charles Band enough capital to purchase a castle in Rome and relocate the company to Italy, where he also purchased the famed De Laurentiis studio. From 1985 to 1988, most in-house pictures were filmed back-to-back -back in the Rome studio. In fact, while John Carl Beekler was directing Troll in one section of the studio during the day, he would run across the studio by night to work on the special effects for another movie, Terror Vision. Like I said last week, Empire went bankrupt in 1989. This movie we're watching today is John Carl Beekler's last movie he directed for the studio. It came out direct to video, but I first saw it as a Saturday afternoon movie back in the years when there was a UPN channel, okay? They used to do this as a way to fill time slots that didn't have a lot of ratings, and it scared the crap out of me. This movie is called Cellar Dweller. And for it, since it was an American movie made in Italy, I decided to do an Italian recipe with an American twist. Fried ravioli. I've already made the dough, and I've already kneaded it. So I'm just going to let it rest on the counter under a damp cloth for about 30 minutes. So let's get started. Our film begins 30 years ago. So I guess 1987? with an artist, played by Jeffrey Combs of Reanimator fame, drawing a comic depicting a girl being eaten alive by a horrible monster. For inspiration, he opens up the Ancient Book of MacGuffin and reads a passage, whereupon the scene he just drew comes to life in his studio. Happens to me every time I read The Art of French Cuisine. Julia Child always comes out and beats me with a broomstick. Well, Coombs realizes the only way to kill the creature is to set its picture on fire, which he does, and apparently descends into hell in the process. Then we get the opening credits, and Richard Band, you've done it again. This music is very atmospheric, and lets us know we're in for a strange, melodramatic, and gothic story. I really could do an entire episode of Richard Band's music. Seriously, his theme for Reanimator is awesome. So while the pasta is resting, I'm going to start on the marinara sauce. Here in the pot, I've got a tablespoon of butter and some olive oil, and I'm sweating some onions and garlic. To that, I'm going to add some whole tomatoes, some diced tomatoes, and some crushed tomatoes. Then I'm going to add a half a can of tomato paste, some basil, some oregano, some Parmesan cheese, and some salt and pepper, and some red wine. I find these little ponies that you can buy at Walmart for like two bucks the exact right amount. After it comes to a boil, I'm going to turn down the heat, cover, and let simmer for at least an hour, stirring every now and again. The longer it cooks, the better it tastes. Okay, so cut to... 30 years later? Is that 30 years after the credits? Look, if you're going to give a time frame, you should just say present day, because the way that it's written makes it seem like it's 30 years after the time this movie is set, which would make it modern day which it obviously isn't. Okay, 
So we see our main character, Whitney, pull up in front of the house where Jeffrey Coombs had his fatal attack of life imitating art. And she goes in to meet... Ah! It's the monster! Wait. Is that a Von DiCarlo? Yes, that's the famed Lily Munster. Obviously in this film because she wanted a free trip to Italy. And she explains the house is now an artist's colony. And the only reason Whitney is here is because the trustees of the colony thought it would be pretty cool to have an artist rewrite the comic books of the previous owner. Yes, Whitney is a comic book artist. And Yvonne DiCarlo has some feelings about that. Childress was a cartoonist. So are you. Not all contemporary art is a populist tripe, Miss Taylor. <laughs> Come along. <clears throat> So, comic books are not art, and are, in fact, filth. One minute, let me get my nerd cap on. I can name four artists off the top of my head. Will Eisner, Jack Kirby, Todd McFarlane, and Jim Lee. All of them are award-winning artists. They all draw or have drawn comic books. And I can bet you dollars to donuts that they have sold more art than anybody in your precious colony. Art is art because it evokes an emotion, not because somebody on a high horse like you says it is. If a reader picks up a comic book and feels a reaction to that art, then it is wrong of you to say that it is not art, and shame on you for belittling it. And that's why... Yvonne DiCarlo is the best part of this movie. Because she actually made me think that she felt that way about comic books. She invoked a reaction in me. And that is art. So while we're here, Let's go ahead and start the stuffing for our ravioli right here. I'm just cooking up some hot Italian sausage. You don't have to use hot, I just like hot. So anyway, Lily Munster takes Whitney on a tour of the house, where we meet a performance artist and our love interest, because there has to be one, who is a modern artist. Then they pass by the door to the cellar, where Jeffrey Coombs died and Yvonne explains it's off limits. So we know right then and there Whitney is going to go down there. Seriously, might as well tell someone on a diet that it's a room full of brownies, but they can't go in there or they will receive a strongly worded letter. But not before we have a strange dream sequence right out of nowhere. Yvonne then shows Whitney to her new room and the love interest, who's just dying to be Ferris Bueller, invites her to his opening, where we meet the last two members of the cast, a guy who thinks pulp murder mysteries are life, and the villainous foil for Whitney, a video artist. I can't wait till there's a cat fight. Okay, so the sausage is cooked, and to that I'm going to add some ricotta cheese, some mozzarella, More mozzarella, yay. Some basil. Some oregano. Some salt. Some pepper. And some garlic powder. Then we're going to mix this all up and just set it to the side until we're ready to use. Now, overnight, Whitney has another dream about the cellar, and is awoken by the performance artist screaming into a storm. As you're wont to do. After a little backstory about Whitney and the video artist, the performance artist goes to bed, and Whitney goes down to the cellar. Because who didn't see that one coming? Anyway, while down there, she runs into our love interest, opens a chest, and she finds the ancient Book of MacGuffin and decides she's moving down there to work. 
After a quick cleaning montage, after all it is the 80s, there has to be a montage somewhere, she starts reading the book and develops the look of our creature. She then goes to lunch and that's when we see the creature in full for the first time. In some really bad lighting. Well, just as the monster appears, the video artist comes down to the cellar, trying to find evidence to frame Whitney for plagiarism. Because, you know, she's evil. That's where we get this scene. I don't know what you're up to, Amanda, but if I, if I ever catch you down here again, I will hang you up by your eyelids and wrench out your fingernails one by one. You got it? Yeah, I do. I'm really scared. This acting just... wow. Good read there, girls. It's absolutely perfect. Check the gate, let's move on. Might as well have been a school play for second graders. I'm amazed they haven't won Oscars. Okay, so the sauce is simmering, the filling is made, so now it's time to roll out the dough. Yes, you can use a pasta maker. I don't have one, so I'm just rolling it out by hand until it's about eh, a quarter inch thick. Now, after their fight, Whitney is drawing a comic strip of the video artist getting killed by the monster. And the video artist, in turn, is making a video framing Whitney for theft. Although, if you just look at it, you can tell that it's been doctored. But what do you know? She gets eaten by the monster in the exact way Whitney draws it. What I love is how absolutely petty Whitney can be. Drawing a banana peel for her to slip on and erasing the doorknob so she can escape. That's like saying, I'm not only going to kill you, I'm going to humiliate you because I hate you oh so much. So, while the monster has his midnight snack, he thinks about who he's going to eat next. Because who doesn't think about their next meal while they're eating? It's very rare to see this contemplative side to a big bad in a film. Just imagine Alien from Alien strategizing his attack. Okay, so I've rolled out the dough and cut it into squares. Now on one, I'm just going to wet the edges. And I'm going to add a spoonful of our mix. Then I'm going to cover it with another piece. Take a fork and seal it together. It gives it a little bit of a look and also keeps it from coming apart. Then we're just going to let it dry. The next day at breakfast, everyone realizes the video artist is missing and the murder mystery guy decides something is fishy. Cut to the evening when everyone is watching the performance artist do her rendition of Oingo Boingo's Little Girls. He goes and investigates and gets eaten. Whitney realizes Yvonne and the video girl were setting her up and then the performance artist gets eaten. Whitney realizes what's going on, blames ye old MacGuffin, and tries to destroy the picture of the monster. Only she's too late and the love interest gets grabbed and pulled into a comic strip. So let's fry these puppies. I have the oil up to about a medium high heat and we're just going to fry these until they're crisp and golden. After the loss of her love interest, Whitney goes and sees Yvonne DiCarlo, who turns into the monster. Whitney runs back to her cellar where the final showdown takes place in the form of throwing paint bottles one of which pours white out all over the comics. After the creature disappears, Whitney gets the idea to draw all the people in the colony back to life. And it works! Until she sets fire to all the pictures, including the ones she drew off screen of the colony tenants. And they all die in excruciating death. When she realizes what she's done, she's attacked by the monster, and the movie ends on the worst O face ever recorded. And the ravioli's done. We're just going to set them on a plate with a side of marinara and then cover it with a nice sprinkle of Parmesan cheese. 
So, final thoughts on the film. This movie is a lot of fun, and actually a good homage to the horror classics of old, down to a classic storyline of a writer's creation coming to life. It's gothic, melodramatic, and over the top. Unfortunately, the lighting is kind of terrible in some scenes. It tries to evoke the lighting of a comic book, but that doesn't translate very well to film. The creature itself is fun, and if you haven't noticed so far, I really enjoy practical effects. It's nice to see actors actually reacting with someone in a suit rather than a tennis ball on a stick. It gives a little more sense of reality. Okay, back to the film as a whole. The pacing's alright, the acting is just the right campiness for the feel of the movie, and all in all, it's a fun little distraction. Also, the writing is pretty good. The writer is credited as Kit Dubois, but you may know him better as Don Mancini. That's right, this movie was written by the longtime writer of the Child's Play franchise. That explains the organic character development and a good sense of timing. It's widely available on DVD and easily found on YouTube for free, so I say grab it while the getting's good. As for the ravioli, serve with a nice red wine. Who am I kidding? I'm just gonna have a nice cold beer along with it. And sit down on a comfy couch with a bunch of friends, relax, and have a good time. Well, thanks for stopping by, thanks for tuning in, and come back next week when John Carl Beekler Month ends with one of my personal favorites he's ever done.